A related issue is treatment beyond progression, which is you started a patient on a checkpoint inhibitor, you got the scan, uh, some patients have progression right off the bat or some initially benefit and then have progression. Sh there is this notion that if you give the drug continue uh, after progression, there might still be some benefit. Uh, what are your thoughts on that issue? I think treatment beyond progression is not an issue of immunotherapy, it's a general concern. It may be a, a good strategy with some TKIs, sometimes with chemo and with immunotherapy, and it's always the same. There are not one kind of progression, there are different kinds. And when it's, for example, an oligometastatic progression with just one or two lesions and all the rest of the disease, but it can be maintenance chemo, it can be immunotherapy or TKI. Our strategy is always try to give a local treatment to uh, the, the, um, the, the, the progressive sites and then go on with immunotherapy. And I, I have to say in some patients, it's a very successful approach. So it's a patient to patient decision. If you have progression at multiple sites, it's clear that the patient is not benefiting. You stop treatment. If there is a local progression here or some slight increase in tumor size, you may want to give the benefit of doubt and continue the checkpoint inhibitor. Is that how you... Yeah, well, it's a customized approach. I mean, it's, uh, as you said, it's a patient by patient approach because uh, uh, this concept of treatment beyond progression came mainly from the field of the oncogene addicted uh, tumors. That is a different type of tumors. Uh, we are dealing with, uh, with a with a, uh, a series of drugs that are working on the immune system. And as you said, when there is a, a systematic progress, system, systemic progression in multiple sites, you can go ahead for another cycle, but then you need to make a therapeutic decision because it doesn't make any sense uh, to opt that three or four month later the patients will uh, will be in remission because this is against the biology of the disease. As we wrap up this discussion on immune checkpoint inhibition, Marina, I want to come back to you about some of the emerging biomarkers. At this meeting we saw assessment of mutation burden, particularly using peripheral blood. Uh, so give us your thoughts on mutation burden as it measured in the tissue, in the blood, and what other markers are you looking out for? Uh, okay, thank you for the question because it's another important issue. So we know that in principle mutational burden is important because you have the creation of the new proteins and the new epitopes and so you can uh, uh, have more immunity against the cancer. And uh, we have also the results from the Checkmate 026 uh, suggesting that when you have a mutational burden high, nivolumab performs better than chemotherapy, but on the contrary, when uh, the mutational burden is low, chemotherapy is much better than nivolumab. So uh, the situation is quite complex because uh, that study was done with the foundation one test, uh, which is a good approximation of uh, the whole exome. And it is quite a reliable test, but uh, at the same time we know that uh, across uh, the labs, but across also the same lab, uh, you can have uh, uh, very different uh, results and the interpretation of the mutational burden is quite difficult uh, in every center. So I think that uh, we are far from the uh, clinical use from tomorrow morning of the mutational burden. This is much more complex if we talk uh, about uh, the mutational burden on the blood, which is uh, like for the GFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it's wonderful to use uh, the mutational burden on the drug and not uh, on the tissue. And we have a good concordance, but uh, I would suggest not to go with the homemade uh, mutational burden test because they can be um, not so concordant with the, the, for example, the foundation one or the whole exome. And another point that I would like to point out is that uh, um, the mutational burden high is an independent factor from the PDL1 expression. So maybe combining together PDL1 and mutational burden, we can select better patients. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, this is far from uh, the daily practice of tomorrow morning. Thank you. That, that was a very nice uh, 
overview I, on biomarkers, Georgia, you want to? If I can to? jump in for just a, a, a quick point. Well, uh, up to now, we are concentrating most of the research on, on the tumor. When we are trying to manipulate the immune system, in principle, we are looking to the uh, tumor microenvironment. And we are, uh, we are always forgetting to address, to check the role of the immune system itself. So uh, I see up to now few research on, on immune infiltrate. And I would like to remember you that also in the context of melanoma, where the immune checkpoints are the standard of care in addition to other agents, but they are really uh, game changers. Uh, the uh, tumor shrinkage has been observed only in those patients in which there is the expression of the immune checkpoint, the, there is the expression of pd one and there is the immunoinfiltrates. That is a paper that has been already published four years ago. And there is less research on, on, on tumor microenvironment up to now. And probably we need to work around that because it's quite unlikely that we will find one single marker to address the issue of immunotherapy, to identify the subgroup. It's a combination of factors looking to the tumor and look into the uh, uh, tumor microenvironment. This is my, my expectation for, uh, for the near future in terms of research. It is clear that a lot more work remains to be done in this space. Uh, in terms of upcoming months, I'm eagerly awaiting the phase three trials of chemo plus checkpoint inhibition to understand where that combination fits in. That's clearly an important clinical question. We, we only have partial answers.